Today we feel the wind beneath our wings. Today the church draws breath at last and sings. As every flame becomes a tongue of praise. This is the feast of fire, air, and water. Pour out and breathe and kindle into earth. The earth herself awakens to her maker. And is translated out of death to earth. The right words come today in their right order. Today, the gospel crosses every border. All tongues are loosened by the grace of peace. Today, the lost are found in his translation. Whose other tongue is love in every nation. Friends, it is Christ's own peace that has been given to us. Christ said, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Please turn to your neighbors and greet them with a sign of Christ's peace. Greetings to you and welcome to Old South Church in Boston. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, and if you aren't up with all of the most recent ecclesial lingo, this is what that means, to be open and affirming. It means that we are a 350-year-long love song sung to God. God who calls us to fling the doors of the church wide open to stand against bondage and injustice, here is a place that believes that the good news of God is first for those who need some good news, first for those who are in need, for the ones who can remember as if it were yesterday, the schoolyard taunts. For those who have been passed over again and again, for those who have been over-policed and underrepresented, for those who have immigrated to these shores for the underdog and the undocumented, you know, the Jesus types. The good news is for the trans and non-binary, the closeted and the questioning. Welcome to you. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey to Old South Church in Boston, welcome to, to a special guest, a former associate minister of Old South Church, an author, a denominational leader, a father, a farmer, a theologian, Quinn Caldwell, first of his name. We are grateful to have you among us today. We would love to know who is with us today, who has joined us in worship. You'll find nearby at hand, next to one of the aisles, we have stashed a friendship pad, a little black pad that we have helpfully stocked with paper and pen. If you give us enough information, or some contact information, an email address is particularly helpful. If you like getting letters in the mail, you could give us a snail mail address and we'll send you something through the mail. We'll reach out and let you know some of the ways that we as a congregation are trying to live into God's call for us in the world. A couple of things to highlight. One is that next week we are having another one of our traveling soup kitchens. This is a ministry that was dreamed up by Ralph Watson, one of our co-senior deacons. It is a tender and beautiful ministry that is as simple as it is brilliant. We have volunteers who come to the church and they prepare a wonderful hot lunch, a fresh lunch, and then they take this and go out and find people on the street who look like they could use a nice meal, and we sit and share a meal together. If you've never been a part of the Traveling Soup Kitchen, it is a wonderful ministry, tenderly and beautifully done. You can find information about that in your announcements sheet. There is plenty going on in the life of this church, whether you are interested in service or worship or fellowship. Let us continue in worship now in the glory of music.
Listen now for the word of God in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus ordered his followers not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of God. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When the day of Pentecost had come, all of the followers of Jesus, about 120 at that time, were together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout people from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? This is the word of God.
be seated. Will you pray with me? Come near God, bend low, enter this your house. Come so near to each of us as to oil the hinges of our heart's doors, that they may swing gently and easily to welcome your coming. Amen. The Bible, our Bible, our sacred text, is a talking book. It begins in speech, efficacious speech, successful speech, words that make things happen. Let there be light, shouts God into the void, and lights appear. These aren't just any words. These are words with wings, words with legs. This is efficacious speech, words that make things happen. Christian, do your words make things happen? The Bible is a talking book. The Israelites brought their suffering to speech. In bondage to the Egyptians, oppressed and tormented, they cried aloud to God, and God in heaven heard their suffering. And God, speaking to Moses, tells Moses, you go have yourself a chat with old Pharaoh. Moses strides over to the palace, stomps up the steps, bangs on the great doors, and right there to Pharaoh. Moses spoke the most confounding, confronting, demanding, morally charged words, let my people go. And no one had ever said those words to Pharaoh before. Those four words, let my people go, they hung there in that throne room, an indictment. One said they couldn't be unsaid. One said the system of oppressor and oppressed was exposed, exposed as rotten, as godless. Those four words spoken, let my people go, were the beginning of the end of Pharaoh's cruelty. The Bible is a talking book, a book of words, words that make things happen. Christian, do your words make things happen. After let there be light and let my people go, it is Jesus who is God's next best word. Jesus is what God has been trying to say from the beginning. Jesus is the logos, the word on the tongue of God. The word that once spoken becomes flesh and lives among us. And Jesus, Jesus was himself a talker, quite a talker. He talked to pretty much everyone and anybody. He was indiscriminate about whom he spoke. He talked to fishermen, to women, to Gentiles, to Samaritans, to Pharisees, to lepers, to the lame, to the blind. He talked to sinners. He talked to peasants. He talked to a king. He talked to Satan. He even talked to the dead. And it was by talking that he made things happen. He healed with words. Take up your pallet and walk. He freed with words. Your sins are forgiven you. He saved with words. You who are without sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. He conquered death with words. Lazarus, come out! He taught with words. A sower went out to sow. Jesus was a talker. He talked to the tempter in the desert. He talked to the crowds on a hillside. He talked to a storm standing in a boat, and he talked that storm down. He talked to Moses and Elijah high up on a mountain, and don't you want to know what they said to each other? Jesus talked to God from the cross and then from the other side of the grave. He talked to Mary and Peter and Thomas. From beyond death, he talked them back to life. Jesus, the word that became flesh, came talking. The Bible is a talking book, a book of words. 
Not just any words and not empty words, words that make things happen. Christian, do your words make things happen? The Tower of Babel is the story of the failure of speech, of confusion and cacophony, of shivery and pandemonium. The witch trials were Babel. Nazi propaganda, Babel. Separate but equal, Babel. Don't ask, don't tell, Babel. Collateral damage, Babel. Babel is everywhere. The so-called newscasters yelling over one another, babblers. Babel is the shock jock and the angry, blithering blogs. Babel is ideology and propaganda, can't and misspeak. It is the sound of human hubris, of dissonance and danger. Babel is the sound of the serpent who seduces Adam and Eve with slippery, slimy words. The serpent is the one who promises that this one piece of fruit, or, or that pill, or that cosmetic, or that lotto ticket, that whatever, will make you wiser, younger, slimmer, richer, stronger, maybe make you live forever. Promise, swear to God, cross my heart. The story of Pentecost, today's story, the story of the birthday of the church, is the answer to the Tower of Babel and to human babble. The triumph of Pentecost is the intelligibility of human speech, of words that work, efficacious speech, words that communicate, words that build and bridge. The story of Pentecost tells us that all the followers of Jesus were together in Jerusalem. And in an instant, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak. And at their speaking, all the crowds, they gathered. And this is Jerusalem, a worldly, cosmopolitan city visited by people from every nation. And that's the crowd comprised of people from every nation under heaven. Afghanistan and South Korea, the Soviet Union and the United States, Haiti and Uganda, the English and the Wampanoag, the Peruvian and the Pakistani. And here's what captured their attention. Here's what was happening that day. Every single one of them, the Kenyan and the Syrian, the Mexican and the North Korean, they all heard the followers of Jesus speaking in the native language of each. They were amazed, captivated, astonished by this feat of understanding. The one who spoke the world into being at the beginning of time, the one whose best word became flesh and lived among us, the same one gives birth to the Christian church in the act of speech, but not just any speech, efficacious speech, successful speech, speech that bridges and builds, speech that communicates, speech with wings and legs, speech that quite literally heals and saves. Christian, do your words have wings and legs? Do your words heal and save and forgive? Just as Samuel Sewell, an early member of this congregation, apologized for having condemned some of the so-called witches to death, he was the only justice to do so. His speech of repentance and confession was Pentecostal speech, churchly speech, godly speech. It turned the tide. Desmond Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Pentecostal speech, godly talk. And this past Thursday, New York City's police commissioner apologized, publicly apologized, on behalf of the New York Police Department for its officers' actions during the Stonewall Uprising in 1969, 50 years earlier. It was late, but better late than never. And here's what he said, I quote, what happened should not have happened. The actions taken by the NYPD were wrong, plain, simple. The actions and the laws were discriminatory and oppressive 
and for that I apologize, end quote. That is good speech, real words, efficacious, meaningful, words that matter. Christian, do your words matter? Do they name truth and, when necessary, apologize? We live in a babbling world. We live in a world filled with babbling, misspeak, cant, and propaganda. A cacophonous world populated with smooth-tongued and not-so-smooth-tongued tempters. We come to church. We gather in sanctuaries like this to listen hard to our sacred texts, to turn off the shock jocks, the ranters, the loud talking heads, to learn the difference between Babel and Pentecost, between trickery and truth, between hubris and humility, between the ways of God and the ways of the world. We come to church, we gather in the presence of God to declare our defiance of Babel and our commitment to churchly speech, godly speech, speech that edifies, builds, bridges, heals, and saves. We come to this place week after week to claim our place as those called and trained to efficacious speech, humble speech, speech that asks questions and probes for insight, speech that points beyond us to God, speech that does some good, speech that raises the dead, and dreams of what might yet be. We come together to learn and practice that sort of speech here, that we might speak it out there, that what we say and how we say it might heal, rescue, defend, forgive, soothe, and befriend. And you, Christian, do your words do such things? Do your words heal? Rescue, defend, forgive, soothe, and befriend. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, help us to speak well. Gracious God, make us to speak good words, words to bridge the divides, words to heal and save and rescue, words with wings and legs words to mend a broken and breaking world, words to mend broken and breaking hearts, words worthy of the Christ in whose name we gather, words, dear God, that will make your heart glad. We ask these things in the name of your word made flesh, even Jesus Christ. Amen.
God be with you. May the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts. Christ is our peace, our life, and our hope. Let us pray. Holy One, for all the ways you speak to us, in rushing wind, in dancing flames, in words we understand, and in all that transcends language, we give you thanks. You sing the language of joy with us. You join us in the dance of life. Hear all of your children who sing and dance and praise this morning, those who celebrate new life with all the possibilities of the future, those who celebrate relationships, both the new and exciting and the long-term and still exciting, those for whom the wonder of life fills their being to the limit May they hear your voice joining in the singing and the shouting. And yet, God of life, you also speak the languages of pain, of sorrow, of fear, of despair. Hear all your children who speak, who wail, who whisper in these languages this day those who find themselves in hospital beds or waiting anxiously beside those beds, those who gather to say farewell to one who is traveling or moving, those who gather at a graveside for that longer farewell, those who worry about where the next meal or the next rent check will come from, those who live in places where peace is just a word a faint hope, a distant dream. May all those whose language is rent by pain hear you lamenting with them. Come, promised Spirit of God, find your way and make your home among us. Set our hearts on fire. Fill our lungs with air and blow us out into the world to live and to serve and to pray in the words that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
bring you greetings, grace, and peace from the, fe from the fields and forests of upstate New York. It is so good to be back here, Old South. I dream about you, you know. When I was here, if I dreamed about Old South, I would dream that old dream where somebody had forgotten to tell me that I was supposed to preach that day and you were all staring at me waiting, or the one that I hated most of all where the procession was just about to start, and I realized that my robes or my hymnal or my sermon were upstairs in my office, and I would try to run up the stairs to get to my office before the service started, but the bell choir would keep coming and coming and coming down the stairs and wouldn't let me up. Not now. Now, when I dream of Old South, I dream about the sound of Willie Sordillo's sax echoing in the chapel. I dream about puttering around in the basement or about kids, herds of kids running around in Mary Norton Hall or all your faces lit by candles on Christmas Eve. Once, I dreamed about the time that an 80-something-year-old, Margaret Linda, pushing 90, when she missed a meeting and couldn't be reached on the phone, and Nancy and I drove to her house, planning to break in, sure that we would find her stretched out on the floor, only to find that she'd gone away to compete in a ballroom dance competition <laughs> and forgotten to tell us. Sweet, these dreams, and a little wistful as they should be. I still dream of you, Old South. You get under the skin. You get under the skin of powers and potentates and people that don't want you there. But you get under the skin of the rest of us, too. There is nowhere else like you in the world. Grand and powerful, faithful and prophetic, beautiful and merciful and imperfect and edgy and brave, so old and so strong. And though she will not thank me for saying it for the second time this morning, your senior minister is the best in the business. She used to be my boss, you know, but she's not now, and there's nothing she can do to retaliate against me. <laughs> and here's what I choose to say in that freedom. She is extraordinary. But you don't need me to tell you that. You also don't need me to tell you that it's true for the rest of the staff in this place as well, another one of whom is now preparing to move on. I'm here to say, if you're worried about John leaving, or anyone leaving, all you have to do is invite us back. <laughs> and we will come with dispatch and delight. We will come with our husbands and our children and our hands full of gratitude and love. It is meet and right that ministers go out from a church like this, a church who has for all these years made it their business to try new things, new worship services, new ministries, new ideas, new work, to raise up and train up and send out new leaders. For a church like this who, when your young ones see visions or your old ones dream dreams, who pays attention. Old South, you love the old things so much. And you are not afraid of the new ones. This is an extraordinary combination. As I was preparing to come here today, I was talking with Nancy and with John about what it would be like on the first Sunday, after John has announced that he's leaving to the congregation, that I, who used to have that same job, came back and we agreed that it was a good thing. And so right now, here's where I was going to do a thing. It was going to be so great. I was going to tell you that we were going to send around two offering plates at the same time, and one would have Quinn on it, and one would have John on it. 
and you would vote for whichever one of us you liked better. <laughs> and we were gonna raise enough money to save the world. It would have been so funny, you would have loved it. <laughs> but the truth is, it would have been too flip for who you are and for what you have done for me. And I dare say for John and Anthony and Liz and Ron and Jennifer and Kate and Lael and on and on and on, though they'll have to tell you about that. You already know what Old South does for you, you who have been here for decades and you who wandered in the door for the first time this morning, you already know, but did you know that it does as much for those of us who work here? Do you know that this place shapes us as much as it shapes you? You get under our skin, Old South, and when you are done with us, our shape is more like that of Christ. Old South, you make us dream. You make the world dream. The morning offering will now be given and received. since you have given us every good gift. 
we pray that in our giving, that some of your will for the world would be made real, that just a bit of that promised realm, that it might come and grow from a seed sent from this place in this hour. Oh God, grant us a piece of that beloved realm to build with you. In all this, O oh God, we pray, trusting not in our own righteousness, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, walk bravely into this new week. Shun the hollow, hallow the good. Forgive those who wound you and wound not in return. Encourage the discouraged. Cherish times with the lonely. Pray in private crannies about all things. Be found celebrating. Practice rejoicing. Encourage laughter in your soul. And may the blessing of Almighty God, our Creator, Christ, our brother and savior in the Holy Spirit, be with you this day and every day, and let the whole church say, Amen. Amen.